Hey, welcome back. I'm Sean Barr, and at Looking Point, we help IT organizations make decisions around collaboration, security, and networking. Today, we're going to be talking about ICE, what it is, how you implement it, and things to consider. And this is the Tech Talk. back and I'm here with my man Dominic and we are talking about ICE. Hey Dom, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me Sean. So let's start out, what, what is ICE? ICE is a network admission control product. It helps secure your access networks in the same kind of way that you'd want to secure your perimeter networks traditionally. And so if I was a customer and I'm thinking about securing my network even more I guess, sure. what are some of the benefits I get with ICE? ICE can authenticate everything attaching to your network, your okay. wired network, your wireless network, your VPN access points. Okay. So it gives you that assurance that all the devices on your network should be there okay. for one. And then secondarily, you can go further and you can inspect what software is running on those endpoints, see what kinds of endpoints they are, and give you that visibility and control okay. over your access networks. Nice. And so things like if I have a mobile device, would that Mobile device, laptop, so, phone. Sure, yeah. I mean, okay. you may want your mobile devices only to get out to the internet okay. when they attach to your corporate networks. Yeah. Whereas your computers, your domain joint machines, you may want them to have full access. You may want your HR department to have access to some accounting servers that you don't want your, your development team to have access to. So ICE will help you institute those kind of policies on your network. So policy enforcement, yeah. authentication, identifying devices, and controlling access. That's what it does. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. And so if I'm a customer or I'm just looking to implement this technology, what are some of the things I should consider before implementing it? What are the things, like is there readiness? What, what, what's that? Yeah, certainly there's readiness. So ICE works hand in hand with your, your network infrastructure, particularly your wireless system and your, your network access switches. So you want to make sure that you're running a recent-ish, you know, at this point in time, we don't run into many customers who don't have a, a network infrastructure that's ready to okay. accept an application like ICE. But there are some basic things you want to check out if you're still running some, you know, old like Cisco 3560 switches, those, those Gen 1 3750 switches, um, you know, you might want to take a closer look. Got for it. that compatibility, yeah. So one of the things we wanted to do in this Tech Talk is, is we covered ICE, what it is, why you'd want it, um, is to talk about a basic architecture and things like if I was going to implement it, what that architecture would look like. Um, so we could draw it up here on the whiteboard sure. um, and maybe step through a couple scenarios. Sure, sounds good. All right, All right. let's draw it up. Draw it up. This, this is a diagram that kind of illustrates um, 802.1x architecture within ICE. So ICE serves as your RADIUS server in this, um, in this picture here. Then you've got your access networks that are hosted by your wired switches. You know, these are going to be in your IDFs. And then you might have a wireless controller, or these could be access points if you're running an autonomous wireless system. Then over here on the, the left-hand side, we have our endpoints that are connecting to the network. Here we've got a computer, a printer, an IP phone some things we commonly see on access networks. So one of the fundamental use cases for ICE is authentication to the network. So we want to make sure that the computers, printers, and um, phones in this case are valid endpoints that we want to connect to the network. Uh, in order to authenticate them, um, we use 802.1x. So the endpoints talk to the switches using a protocol called EEP. We can forget about the details for a second. The switches proxy that authentication information to your RADIUS server. So ICE could live um, in a data center across the WAN. You could put it local to where your access networks are at. It doesn't matter. RADIUS is a routed protocol, right? So these access switches and controllers, they're going to take those credentials sent by your, your endpoints connecting to the network. They're going to forward them to ICE. ICE is going to use a robust policy engine to make a decision on whether or not the endpoint should get access to the network or um, a limited set of access to the network. And for that purpose, ICE integrates with identity stores. So this most commonly is Microsoft Active Directory. Most of our customers already have a, you know, pretty 
robust security group architecture there. All their users, when they get onboarded, get put in the appropriate groups. ICE can leverage all of that existing directory structure to make decisions about what devices should be allowed on the network um, and what level of access they should get to the network. So let me ask you a question then. So these devices, the switches, and the endpoints will typically be in the same site, right? Correct. But, yeah. And I think you mentioned this ICE or RADIUS is a routed protocol. So the ICE authentication servers could mm -hmm. be back in a data center or centrally managed where you could have remote offices with switches and access points in the office. These devices are obviously in that office, yep. but they could still authenticate back centrally to a single ICE instance or maybe a couple data centers. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then you mentioned once they're authenticated, what are some of the things that we can do from an ICE perspective? Because you mentioned like limiting access and things mm -hmm. like that. How does that, how does that work? So um, there are a number of ways it could work. It could be as simple as ICE looks at what active directory group you belong to, right? And we can write a policy that says this active directory group gets this level of access to the network. Um, we can use more advanced techniques like profiling. So ICE will take in um, uh, metadata about the endpoints connecting to the network. Uh, using attributes that endpoint sent in its DHCP request, using CDP information off the switches, LLDP information off the switches, and will attempt to profile a device into um, being a Windows 10 computer or being uh, a printer, a Ricoh printer. And then you can write policies that said devices that look like a Ricoh printer get this level of network access. It essentially makes the network smarter by leveraging some of the things that the devices share with the network, and then we write policy around it. Yeah, when you think about it, there's so much information that the network has access to that we just haven't used, that's just been discarded. ICE makes use of all of that information uh, to determine um, you know, what, what policy and what level of access we want you to have to the network. Okay, so that this is a great high-level overview. What's under the hood, like when when we push policy to a switch, is it using an ACL? How does that how does that get done, or is there multiple ways? Of multiple ways of doing it, and that that is where you know the the generation of equipment you have at your access network plays a role. The the make and model play a role. So it can be as simple as ICE instructing the switch to put users on a different VLAN. That's kind of the base case. Any any switch that supports 802.1x will support a VLAN change. And in that scenario, the access control will be on the SVI on the network that that, that VLAN belongs to. The ACL will be on the SVI on that, right. that um, VLAN. More often, uh, we'll be pushing policy down to the port that the endpoint's connecting to, right? So that's where we get into micro-segmentation. Uh, and micro-segmentation can be done with an ACL, right? So we just push your standard classic ACL, but instead of applying it centrally to like the core switch, on the VLAN, we're gonna apply it to the port that the endpoint's connecting to. Got it, so you could have everyone on the same VLAN, yeah. but have different levels of access to the network based on the way they were authenticated on ICE. Right, right, yeah. Okay, great. One of the other ways that you can enforce policy on the network is um, assigning, again, everybody could be connected to the same VLAN. Instead of pushing an ACL down to the port, we're just gonna push a tag down to the port. We're gonna say, endpoint connecting through this port is in group one, right? Mm -hmm. And then we write a policy on ICE that says, group one is allowed to talk to group two using these ports and protocols. No IP addresses at all, anywhere in our policy. So we're using these tags now to filter access. Um, and Cisco refers to that as their trust sec architecture. Okay. Is that better because it's more scalable? Yeah, it, it's, it's easier to manage at scale because we're no longer dealing with specific IP addresses per site, right? So one of the, the problems that TrustSec was aiming to solve was accessless sprawl, right? You turn up a new site or a new data center, now that has this new IP range associated to it, now I gotta go back through my whole enterprise and I gotta update all of my ACLs with the information about this new IP range. Yeah. Uh, TrustSec solves that by classifying things into group. We don't care about the IP address anymore. Um, you know, and, and if you look historically, the IP address was just meant to provide your location on the network, right? right. And where you can be reached on the network. We've overloaded the IP address um, with your security context as well, right? So now your IP address is not just where you're, you're located on the network, but it's also what you're allowed to do on the network. So TrustSec kind of separates that 
um, that security context from the IP address and puts it into its own uh, paradigm using the security group tags. Got it. So it's kind of separating where you are from who you are. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. So now we covered like the high level ICE architecture, how it works. What about um, just covering what a small deployment would look like? Maybe redundant small deployment. We could go through something like that. Sure. Let's draw it up. All right. All right, so your, your ICE appliance can be, um, you can have a single ICE appliance to perform network access control for your entire network. Uh, the limiting factor there would be redundancy, right? Mm -hmm. So if that ICE appliance goes down, your network access control can be affected, right? You can either fail open or fail closed. But that being said, uh, one ICE node can service your, your deployment, and each ICE node runs um, three distinct uh, fundamental services. So there's the PAN role, so primary administration node. That's where I'm going to log in and do all of my configuration. As the administrator to the system, I am just interacting with this, okay. this service that ICE provides. Um, ICE also has a role called uh, monitoring and troubleshooting. So this is the log collector, right? So all of the, the authentications that get processed by ICE, everything that ICE does um, results in a log that gets sent to the ICE server that's running the monitoring role, right? So if I'm logging into the PAN and I'm looking through the logs, the PAN is actually pulling the logs from the MNT service okay. running on that node. And then um, the workhorse of the ICE deployment is the PSN. So it's the policy services um, persona. This is the, the service that runs RADIUS okay. on, on those nodes. So in that previous diagram where we were looking at the network switches and the wireless controllers integrating with ICE through RADIUS, this is the service that they're integrating with. Um, so the IP address of the ICE server that's running this node is where you would point RADIUS for those devices for authentication. You got it. Got it. Yep. Okay. So in a small deployment uh, at limited scale, you could get away with one node running all three of these, these roles. In Cisco's terminology, they call them personas, right? So I may, I may say that word interchangeably. Um, and then for redundancy, you could add a second one of these nodes, right? And that would constitute a small ICE deployment. Now, how, does, how do they replicate information? How does that work? Is it just there's a database sync? Is that kind of Exactly. So the, the database synchronization occurs between the ICE nodes, right? And that all happens behind the scenes uh, after you join the ICE nodes to a deployment. You really don't have to worry about that anymore. Okay. Um, and all of the, the policy that you configure on the PAN over here gets replicated down to, to the PSNs. In this case, it's all one box, mm -hmm. so there, there is no real need for replication. Uh, but when you have these two nodes over here, anything that you do on the primary admin node will get replicated over to your second node. So all of your policy configuration is done from one place, no matter how large your ICE deployment is. And so when you point your devices to the PSN, it sounds like also you could scale this out and have multiple PSNs at maybe mm -hmm. a location, and then those devices locally could point to a local PSN. Yeah, good point. And that's, let's, let's look at a larger ICE deployment now okay. and see how these roles would separate. So here we're looking at a larger ICE deployment. In this model, we distribute those three core services onto dedicated appliances, right? Okay. So it's still all part of the same ICE deployment, and I'm still managing the entire deployment from the primary administration node. Uh, this is a little confusing. This says PAN over here. It's actually the secondary administration node. It's an active standby. Okay. So if the primary administration node were to fail, the secondary gets promoted, and that's where you can log in and do all your config changes. So a common architecture that we see for a large deployment is we put our PAN and MNT nodes at two different uh, geolocations in the customer's network, so for, for fault tolerance reasons and disaster recovery reasons. And then the policy service nodes, these can be deployed anywhere in the network, right? So these can be local to the site if you want to have local authentication services. You can have some deployed at your data centers uh, to provide central authentication services. That's really where the art of designing your, your ICE system comes into play. Um, but this solution can scale up to have 50 dedicated policy service nodes. What that means in the end, I think right now the current scale is ICE can support somewhere along the lines of 500,000 endpoints connected to a single deployment, which really covers the, the use case for, 
most pretty much most organizations. Yeah. Some questions. So these are all three of these nodes are in data center one. These three are in data center two. Primary management is through this PAN node. Now, if this PAN node fails, is it a different IP address to access that one? Yeah, so all of these components in the environment have, have their own IP addresses. Okay. Yeah, so um, if that PAN were to fail, the ICE deployment doesn't go down, right? So, so these nodes Still could be offline, okay. right? All, all of those nodes can be offline. Since these nodes are the ones providing the, the authentication in runtime, when a device connects to the network and we need to authenticate that endpoint and push down its policy, um, these are the critical components to be up. So we'll have our network devices down here, and we'll point them to redundant policy service nodes. And there really is no limit on how many policy service nodes we can configure on these guides. Um, you know, typically we'll see two or three done uh, across a couple different locations. But as long as these nodes are up, these nodes integrate directly with those ID stores, so like Microsoft Active Directory. Um, so we can perform authentications to the network um, even in this situation where our, our back-end servers, if you want to call the PANs and MNT that are down. Okay. All right. And so you mentioned these are appliances, so these are running on VMware or some hypervisor? Sure, yeah, you can run on a physical appliance okay. um, if you want to. So Cisco um, sells a hardware appliance that you can, you can install and run ICE on, or you can run them on Hyper-V, you can run them on VMware, you can run them on KVM. Okay, cool. So yeah. we, we pretty much covered the, the beginning in ICE, like why you'd want it, yeah. what it is, some implementation approaches, and how you could scale out the architecture. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, I really appreciate you being here today, and thanks for taking us through ICE and the basics. And obviously, you've written a lot of blog articles about this, and you go into a lot more detail around authentication, which has been awesome. Yeah, check those out. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for watching today. If you want any more information about ICE or maybe even just implementation guides, you can check out lookingpoint.com and check out our blog. Dom's done a great job putting together a whole ICE series, so check it out there. And then also, make sure you like and subscribe so you get all of our content as we release it, and we'll see you on the next. Tech Talk. Thanks for watching.